So yes, uh, I'll be talking about how we use ML inside uh, MIP servers in practice, and this is joint work with some very intelligent people. Um, so the agenda for this will be four projects where we used ML inside different servers, actually. And uh, before we go into those projects, I would first like to um, yeah, explain myself what I actually mean by ML in this particular case by MIP, by MIP servers. So let's get started. What do I mean by those terms here? Well, um, mixed integer programming, the obvious, like we've seen a couple of times in uh, the last days, we're talking about maximizing or minimizing, doesn't really matter, a linear objective function over a set of linear constraints, and some or all of the variables should take integer values, and some or all are bounded. Well, that's clear so far, and more specifically in this presentation, I will talk about general MIP. So we don't we consider at any point particular classes where we say, okay, now everything is might be knapsack, or our test set is set covering plus combinatorial auctions or so. No, um, we would usually use something like MIPLIP. So we have extremely heterogeneous test sets, and the servers that we use for this are already highly optimized. So in most cases, we will only see small improvements, but those would be counted as a yeah, big success in this area. Okay, so um, what do we mean by MIP solvers? Well, obviously, some software that solves these problems to proven optimality, so we won't consider heuristic approaches in this presentation. Um, and also, and this is key, we don't allow here any application-specific input or so. So the solver is essentially treated as a black box for the user. Problem in, solution out, how can we use ML in between to make this a bit faster? So specifically in this presentation, most of the times I will use FICO Express, and in the last section we will see some results that have been compiled with Skip. And um, we'll look at two particular parts of the MIP solving loop here. Those will be scaling in the first half of the presentation and cutting planes in the second one. And um, Nothing at this point for the other parts. If you want to see how we can use ML for scheduling heuristics, then check out Antonio's poster outside. And yeah, so what do I mean by machine learning today? So in most of the cases, what we want to do is learning a typically binary decision on which action to take, or rather on which of two, or in one case more, alternatives we want to run two different algorithms. We want to decide which is likely to be the better one. So you could think of this as a classification task, but I will soon argue why we rather should think about this as regressions. In all cases, we do offline supervised learning. As said before, we have very general, very, very heterogeneous test sets, so therefore also very generic labels, as we will see and nothing is trained for an individual application. All of this is trained on, well, MIPLIP or customer instances, which are very diverse. So, and we want an easy to evaluate and ideally even an interpretable model. On the latter, latter part, we won't always succeed, Elias. Since you work with customers, yes. why are you not interested in tuning the solver for their instances when you have a distribution over daily yeah. or weekly or whatever? Um, this is a relevant question and uh, something that we might look into at some point, but it's actually not a common case that customers have a huge amount of, I mean, there are these customers which do the same thing every day and uh, they have a huge amount of data, but the typical case for our customers is rather that we have like one or two models from them. They do solve some problem which they then use to plan a process which stays in place for a year or so. Um, so there would be applications for this, but not what we consider today. OK, so um, I said we actually want to do something like classification, but I would rather treat this as a regression task most of the time. So why is this? Um, well, the labels here, if you say, I use a regression would be something like improvement factors, not 
this procedure work better or this procedure work better. And this is because draws are a typical case here. Yeah? So um, consider this instance here. Just let's say that's running time. Both are exactly the same. So how would you label this? this if you need to decide for one classification, this might already um, irritate a training algorithm. Um, also, misclassifications are not too bad if uh, the performance is very close, which is another typical case. So if you would classify this instance here, which while well, the yellow algorithm is a tiny bit better as red, that's not too bad in practice. But this one would be a big failure here. So, OK, so if there's one thing that you take away from this presentation, then maybe it's just this already. Yes. Yes. Work better than what? So it's like pairwise then? This one? Yeah, we typically have pairwise comparison. Um, and yeah, it's not classifying the one or the other algorithm as the incumbent, but we are labeling typically by a factor between whatever our measure is. Most of the time it's time, but not always. OK, so let's start with the project that dragged me into this topic, that's learning to scale. So it was some three years ago. Um, I started with this, and maybe as a disclaimer first, when I say scale here, this is not scale like in a business buzzword sense, so that's not what we're doing. This is scaling in uh, mathematical programming since we're preconditioning matrices. OK, so back at the time, um, I and we screened literature. And well, there's a huge activity in this field already like uh, until three years ago. Uh, but only very few of these have been and still are implemented in general purpose MIP servers or even activated by default. So why is this? There's a couple of reasons. I have uh, already pointed at some. Um, so there are typically heuristic decisions that we care about. So there's not really a ground truths, there are in many cases very sophisticated rules already in place, so you're really fighting uphill if you're competing against 50 years of engineering. Um, the heterogeneous test sets play a lot into this, this is not what the vast majority of publications considers, and uh, in many cases we don't even really know good features that are general enough. Okay, so but then came to my mind that scaling would be a perfect choice, so if this works on anything, then it would be scaling. Um, first of all, we have an either or decision here, not like trying to predict which variable to branch on. Currently, we have some very meaningful features, and uh, ashamed to say, at least at this point, there was no good rule in place. It is now, um, so a lot of these is kind of outdated. Um, and before I start to define what I really mean by scaling, um, let's first give the motivation, and that's numeric stability. So numeric stability is a very crucial topic in MIP solving. Um, there's a shameless self-plug for a blog series I wrote on this with five different episodes, different aspects of numerics in MIP solving. Um, and this is because real-life applications, they're often very complex, they're numerically challenging, there are a lot of big M constraints, for example, in there that can lead to trouble. And back in the time, uh, more than half of the client problems uh, that came in via support that I saw had some form of numeric issues. So that's a lot. So um, after performance, numeric failures really were our most common support request. So um, this has changed significantly. And the reason is, well, learning to scale what we going to present now. Um, first, let's look at what MIP solvers actually tell you about numerics. So the specific case of Express, um, you would get some a priori information about your model. So you would get the coefficient, well, not really distribution, but the spread, the minimum and the maximum uh, element that you see there of your coefficients of your right-hand sides and your bounds, both for your original model and for your well, pre-solved and scaled model, which will be uh, handled by the solver, then actually um, keep this in mind. These spreads, they're going to become important soon. And then a posteriori, what you would usually get is a report on numeric issues that the solvers encounter. This could look like this for 
a mildly numerically challenging problem. There are some failures of the dual simplex, uh, some failures of the primal, and so forth. Yes. Uh, so that this that didn't converge, that it cycled, psych, for example, and you had to abort and fall back to, well, what you would do in case of a dual failure is that you fall back to primal. If primal fails on the same LP, you would just branch on that node without um, having an LP solution, which is, can be bad for performance, of course. All right. So um, what this does mostly is this, it raises awareness to the user. Yeah? If you see something like this, or even worse, and maybe can see where it comes from, might be hint that you want to change your model, or that you would need to try some non-default controls. So um, let me mention one more tool that you have, and this is the computation of the attention level. This is a non-default feature for a reason. Um, so the condition number of a matrix, A, provides a bound on how much a small change in B can affect X. So this is the interpretation of what we see here. So the keyword here is error propagation. This is what you want to uh, estimate by the condition number, which is defined for a square invertible matrix as the norm of the matrix times the norm of its inverse. So um, this typically gives you a good indication whether you might expect uh, numerical troubles or not from that IP that's solved with this basis. Um, there's the optional feature of sampling these condition numbers throughout the search, and uh, if you activate this, you will get a report like this, how many times the condition number was considered stable, suspicious, unstable, and this is just different orders of magnitude in the thing. This is, if it's less than 10 to the 9, and this is something, if it's greater than 10 to the 18, or so, something in that, that order. And um, this is then summarized to a single attention level, so if everything is stable, and this would be zero. If everything is ill posed, this would be one. And yeah, in between tells you how numerically challenging your problem is. So this is a non-default feature, as I said, and this is mainly because it's expensive to compute. Okay, so in one purpose of scaling, or the main purpose of scaling, is to reduce condition numbers to improve um, the preconditioning, uh, the condition of the matrix. So, in that sense, IP scaling refers to the well, iterative multiplication of rows and columns by scalars to reduce the absolute magnitude of non-zero coefficients in matrix, and also the right-hand side and the objective, and well, also reduce, the, in particular, the relative difference between them, because this is typically what leads to issues. Um, yeah, as I said, the reason for this is improving the numerical behavior of the algorithm and to reduce error propagation. Okay, so um, just let's consider your standard basic linear program. So scaling multiplies rows and columns to bring coefficients well, on one scale. This is where the term comes from, multiplies by scalars. Here it is again. And you could roughly visualize this like this. So you have uh, different orders of magnitude here in your coefficients. And you just multiply your row vectors and your column vectors such that they would be roughly on the same scale. Okay, and there's two principal methods that you use for this in solvers. The first one is equilibrium scaling. This is, in a sense, the most simple way that you can think about. You just go through each of the rows, divide by the largest entry to bring this down to one. Then you do the same with the column-wise swipe. You can repeat this a couple of times if you wish to, and um, yeah, at one point you're happy. Then there is a more global view of this, as Curtis Reed's scaling. Here you actually solve a yeah, tiny auxiliary optimization problem to minimize the least squares deviation from one of all of your coefficients. Okay, um, and yeah, mathematically this would look like this. So you would get as a result um, scaling vectors which you need to apply to your matrices, right-hand sides, and uh, your variable vector. <laughs> um, let's look at uh, an example. Um, 
for scaling. So assume well, a global pandemic is going on, uh, you have to stay at home, uh, you're bored and you want to set up your own little home business to um, make boxes um, and chess pieces of, out of wood. Yeah, so a good woodworker, you want to maximize the profit, you have a limited amount of wood, obviously, and uh, to start this process, you have to buy tools. They're cheaper for the boxes, uh, and they're more expensive for your chess sets, um, but also the chess sets will give you more revenue. So what's the uh, optimal revenue that you can get is formulated in this little MIP problem here. This has some binary variables uh, for your setup if you want to produce boxes, you first need to buy your box tools, which is represented here in the, in the objective. Okay, so far so good. Um, this is the coefficient matrix, and this here is one possible basis matrix of this n square invertible submatrix uh, of this problem. Okay, if you look at this unscaled, this looks like this. Uh, the basis inverse would look like this, and the condition number of this is 245. So if you now apply equilibrium scaling, you would bring everything to a maximum of one. So actually here in both row and all rows and all columns, the maximum is exactly one. So this is like a perfect case for equilibrium scaling. The um, basis inverse also will look scaled now, but the condition number actually stays the same. If you do Curtis Reed scaling, on the other hand, so um, I don't know whether you double check. So what you did here for equilibrium scaling was just you divide it by 100 the second in the third row. And uh, for Curtis Reed scaling, you do this, but then you also uh, divide the first row by 100 and consecutively multiply these two columns by 100. So you get a minus one, zero, minus one matrix here. The same holds uh, for the basis inverse. It's zero, minus, minus one, one. And the condition number will be 25. So this is better and actually the best one that you can get for this problem or this base. Um, okay, so what we want to do here now is uh, learn which of the two we want to use. We just saw an example where Curtis sweet scaling would be better, but this is not always the case. Uh, and there are also quite a few cases where equilibrium scaling is better. Also, this is the faster method, um, but we're actually not trying to predict the the overall runtime here, but we want to predict which one leads to the smaller attention level. As I said before, what we will predict, therefore, is the factor between the attention levels of both problems. Features that we use here are, for example, the coefficient distribution that we saw on that slide earlier that would be uh, reported. Ah, Phoebe. It's probably a silly question. Um, is there a way to, um, pose an optimization problem that finds the best way of uh, scaling? Um, yes, so Curtis, weed scaling does, is an attempt at this and does the, the, the best scaling for your original full matrix, but this does not necessarily carry down to the sub-matrices that you will see later on in your, during your solution process. I see, so, but I mean, yeah, there's no way then of taking for any given problem, formulating an optimization problem that would find the one that has like, the smallest condition number. No, this would mean that you need to rescale essentially at every simplex iteration. Yeah. So that's not tractable. So you could, but you wouldn't. Um, okay. So uh, we will compute the coefficient spread here. So this is just the maximum divided by the minimum. Um, so this is the factor between the largest and the smallest coefficient in absolute values. And we take the logarithm of this. So this gives you the number of orders of magnitude that are in between your largest and your smallest coefficient. As a rule of thumb, just as a side note, something like six orders of magnitude is typically considered okay. Uh, everything that's larger, um, you quickly get into numerical troubles. But that's not a given. So you can also, with smaller ones, you can get into numerical troubles. And larger ones might just solve. OK, so this is really just a rule of thumb. OK, so we would use then the difference between these two as features. And we would do the same for the objective spread and the right-hand side 
spread tears. If you use them as feature, then you already ran both algorithms, so then you don't need yes. to. Yes, yes. What we do here is we run both algorithms. They are relatively fast, fast but then we decide which of the two scaled models uh, we will use throughout the remainder of the search. This is a very important point, yeah. But why do you need to predict the attention level? If you already applied it, you, you can compute it. I know mm -hmm. the attention level is the after solve. The attention level is after solve. This would be um, compiled from all basis matrices that you see throughout uh, your solution process. This is done before you even solve your first LP. Maybe you just need to define for us attention level. I think that's where the confusion is. Yeah. So, um, but what it means is that you uh, take the condition numbers, you essentially bin them into four categories, and have a weighted sum of how many um, of the LP bases with their condition numbers goes into which bin. And the lowest one would get weight zero. After the fact. After, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so what we do then with these features and this label uh, is that we use a linear regression model to predict the factor between them. We also tried random forest, neural nets. They were not much better than the linear regressor, so we decided to go with the most simple, most interpretable model at this point. Um, we trained this on well, more than 1,000 customer MIP instances. Those are ones that are particularly numerically challenging, so that's not all of our customer models. Um, and yeah, let's look at the outcome of, the, uh, of, our val of a validation set. So we split this in training test and a validation set. So with our standard or equilibrium scaling that we used before, this would be something like an average attention level of well, close to 0.12. Um, Curtis Reed scaling, if you always use Curtis Reed, this would be. Um, quite a bit better. Uh, if you always had a perfect predictor, each time took the perfect decision, then this is what you, where you would end up about half the it, average attention level of the standard equilibrium scaling. And this is where we got with our learned model, very close to the optimum. So this is a nice result. And it perfectly uh, carries over to um, all the different criteria that we have to judge whether something is numerically challenging or not. I will not go into details of uh, every of this, but um, we could reduce the number of dual and primary failures that, we, um, that I already mentioned. Inconsistencies between different ones of models, everything that can go bad, vi solution violations, so where the final result, if you unscale again, would be outside your feasibility tolerances. And most importantly, this is the factor of almost two that we just saw here on um, our MIP test set. This was performance neutral, which is nice. Yeah? So you, I mean, you don't get faster by this, but you get numerically more stable. Cool result. And on our Simplex test set, we even at that point got about 10% faster, which is a nicer <laughs> achievement. OK, um, let's stay, uh, stay with numerics and scaling. or. Well, with numerics for a little bit, a follow-up project of this was learning the attention level, like the actual number. So, so far, we predicted for two different methods what would be the factor between them. We never needed to know the actual level by itself. As I said before, um, the attention level is an indicator of numeric sens sensitivity of the problem. It ranks between 0 and 1, but some of its disadvantages are well, it's computed a posteriori, so we will only learn after the solve that something was bad. And uh, since it uses the condition numbers of the AP bases, which are expensive to compute, it's a non-default feature. This is, uh, in a sense, the best feature that you can use for the numerical analysis of your problem, but you have to deactivate it for a certain one. OK, so this is why we want to do an ML-based prediction where in the beginning of the solve, uh, we want to tell the user, this looks like a problem that might lead to high attention le level. You might want to reconsider it. You might want to switch this compu computation on and check out yourself whether this is the case. So 
uh, in the end, all we want to do here is use machine learning to print a warning. Okay, so we will use the, or we use the same um, uh, features that we used for learning to scale, plus a fourth one, which uh, is the conditioning of the matrix with respect to the right hand side. Okay, um, in this case, we settled for a random forest, uh, simply because the linear regression was not good enough in this case. And what you see here is the confusion matrix of our results. So um, we had an accuracy, got an accuracy of about 98%. Per percent. So this is um, taking the prediction of the number, and there's a certain threshold. I think it's 0.05. And we want to know, is this above this or not? And does did our prediction tell us the same thing? And see here, so the most common case that you see is that well, everything's okay, and this is also what your prediction does, cool. Um, the next common one is that the actual attention level will be high, and we also predicted it to be high, so this is why we do all of this to warn the users. There's a couple of cases uh, where we had a false positive, so we predicted that you would get a high attention level, but this was actually not the case. And um, there were only two false negatives. And why am I pointing this out in this detail and not just listening, uh, list, list the accuracy here? Well, this is because false negatives are much more harmful than false positives, just like in medical applications like we saw before. If you get the wrong prediction that you might have a bad disease, this stresses you out, but then you can double check and might find out that this is, was a false alarm. So, this is not nice, but not too bad. But the really bad thing is if you get a false negative. So you have a bad disease, but the test returns that you don't have it, and you don't take action. OK, and well, in the end, what will happen is that after solving the initial LP, you might get a warning here. And this might cause you to well, abort the solution process and do something about uh, your model or to enable the attention level computation to see how bad it really is, and so on. All right, um, if you're not a fan of numerics, uh, we are completely switching topics now. Everyone who bailed out is happily invited back on. Uh, we'll start more or less from scratch, learning to use local cuts. So um, this is a mixed integer program. Little example here depicted twice the, twice the same model on the right-hand side. And how do we solve MIPS? So on the first uh, day, Andrea told us about um, cutting planes. There was another standard algorithm, which is branch and bounds. So what you would do here, you solve your continuous relaxation. Um, then you split on one of the fractional variables, create two subproblems. Um, then you decide for one of them, solve again, rinse and repeat. And at one point, you might find a feasible solution, then you can bound uh, the remaining problem, and you would continue like this until you explored all subproblems. Um, and the other one is the cutting plane method that uh, Andreas spoke about. So here you would again start with solving your continuous relaxation. You would then compute an inequality that separates this point from the set of all feasible solutions. And uh, as we know, there's cheap methods to always do this. We can always generate such an inequality. Um, and again, rinse and repeat. Weak, solve your problem with that cut edit, and again, and again, until at one point you find a feasible solution. And if you solve your problem solely by cuts, this one will already be the optimal solution. So unlike bunch and bound, where you can find suboptimal solutions in between. OK. Um, what you do in practice is that you combine these two methods uh, with each other. And there's two meaningful ways to do so. One is cut and branch. So you do your cutting on your problem, and once you decide it, uh, you're good, you start just branch and bound. Or you do branch and cut. So at each node, you would uh, generate some cuts and iteratively cut and branch and cut and branch again. And the question that we want to answer in this project here is which of the two is better? Um, I would like to define or discriminate a little bit more different kinds of cutting planes from one another. So 
The obvious thing that we always think about are global cuts, so those are ones that would be generated for the full problem at the root nodes, and uh, obviously they would be uh, valid for the whole problem, just by construction. Then there are cuts that are generated only for some of your sub-problems. These are called local cuts. They're generated locally at internal nodes with respect to local bounds. And these can either be globally valid, for example, if you generated uh, zero one half cuts where you only used original constraints. Um, so, or they can be um, only locally valid. So if you look at this example here, this cut is obviously valid for the subproblem where it was created, but it's also valid for this problem. Not very useful, but valid. This cut here on the other side uh, cuts off some of the solutions in the other problem. So it's only valid for this problem on this side. So this might be something like implied bound cuts, which used implications from, uh, derived from the local bounds. Okay, for the remainder of this presentation, whenever I say local cut, I will refer to the last case, locally valid local cuts. So, how good are local cuts? Is it a good idea to use them for general MIP? Well, like before, it depends. So the majority of instances benefit from local cuts. But there is a non-ignorable number of instances that suffer from local cuts. So that get slower to solve if you use local cuts in your standard fashion. And there's a middle ground. You see that this does by far not add up to 100%. There's a middle ground where both procedures are roughly the same performance-wise. So it's a crucial question whether we want to generate cutting planes at internal tree nodes or only at the root node or in a sense whether we want to run a branch and cut or a cut and branch algorithm. Um, well, cuts are an essential part of branch and bound algorithms. This is why we usually by default would generate them locally. Um, but why can it be bad? So first of all, they can block some other solver features. Think of conflict analysis, which tries to derive globally valid information from a local infeasibility when this local infeasibility was produced by a local cut, you cannot uh, derive a globally valid constraint from this. So local cuts might block there. And then uh, they might just not be very efficient. So cut generation costs some time. Um, the cuts make the AP solve faster. So if you don't save on nodes as a return, then overall you would get slower. Mark. So I know the local cuts that are globally valid is outside the scope. But do you have any intuition for the 45% of instances that significantly yes. benefit? Uh, if these are benefiting from globally valid, like could they also benefit from locally generated cuts that are globally valid? Or no, this benefit kind of exclusively would come from the locally valid cuts? Um, so in this particular case, the, the solver, express the solver that we use there would only generate locally valid local cuts. It would not uh, make them globally valid. Uh, available even if they are, but in general they could. And we, the, we, the reason for this is uh, we tried and it was not beneficial overall. But again, this is the next, might be the next ML project where we can learn whether we want to do this. Is there another question? No. Okay. So we tried to do the obvious and uh, predict at the beginning of the tree search. So we, before we branch the first time whether local cuts will work for the present problem or not, or uh, like depicted here. So after our root node pre-solving and cuts our cutting plane loop, we would decide, do we go for a pure branch and bound after this no cutting plane generation in the tree, or would we go for a branch and cut algorithm? Okay, so uh, for answering this question, we again trained a reg regression forest um, to predict the speed up factor. Um, that you get by deactivating local cuts. Same, same as before on a bigger set of instances, not only the numerically challenging ones this time. And um, we use different features like uh, row types, the percentage of binaries. So intuition here could be that you can try to classify whether this is more of a combinatorial problem or not. Uh, some what I call semi-static features, uh, which would be um, the density of the problem, so this changes by pre-solving, and also the numeric conditioning that we saw before. And yeah, so the idea here is that this indicates whether adding cuts might lead to uh, expensive APs, 
And in the end, the uh, well, quite dynamic feature, the gap closed by cuts at the root node. Um, and this is, I guess, the most obvious feature. If cuts help at the root node, they might help during the research. If they don't, probably not. So, okay. Timo, these yes. two versions of the algorithm are uh, both using uh, cutting planes uh, at the root node. Yes, yes. The, the root processing will be exactly the same. This prediction is only done at the end of the root uh, before you start branching. And yeah, we got some nice results, uh, nice for general MIPS. So we could save an overall of 2% of time here on all of our uh, MIP benchmark set. Um, if we only look at the affected instances, so those, those we now wouldn't do uh, local cuts, we would before have done it, so this, the default before was essentially to always do it, with very few exceptions where you wouldn't. Um, but you also see that while you reduce the overall runtime, the number of nodes increases, and that's expected. Yeah? So you switch off a feature which would help you saving nodes on a consideration that this saving in the number of nodes doesn't make up for the time that you need for solving those nodes. Okay. Um, and then coming to uh, the last topic for so today now. What was the last column uh, in the pre preview picture? PDI is? PDI, prime do integral. Favorite measure. <laughs> um, learning to select cards. This is uh, joint work with this smart man sitting over there asking questions uh, each and every day. Um, and yeah, so cut selection. Um, what is this? What do I mean by cut selection? So uh, as I already mentioned, cuts are generated in mount. So you separate, you solve the AP, separate, solve the AP, and so on. So um, the separation procedure by itself is typically quite cheap in comparison to the following AP solve. So what this implies is that you can afford to generate much more cuts than you actually need, and then pick out the best ones that you would like to add to your problem. And again, you have to do a trade-off here. Do I want to add more cuts? This will lead to expensive LPs. Might also need to numerical issues as seen before. Or do I want to add less cuts? Well, this means I would um, solve more nodes in the end. So there's a sweet spot in between. And the question that we want to answer here is not how many cuts uh, do we select, but which criterion uh, out of a different selection do we want to use for our selection? So how do we want to rank these cuts? Okay, um, quickly flying, uh, flying over the state of the art, uh, our efficacy and directed cutoff distance. So the intuition of efficacy here is that you want to maximize this distance. So a cut is good if um, the cutting plane is far from the, uh, the IP solution from which it was separated. So if this distance here is big, intuition is that this would mean that you chop off a big part of the polyhedron. And directed cutoff distance is similar. It also measures a distance, um, but not orthogonal, like in the efficacy case, but towards the current incumbent solution. So um, we argue that uh, both of this might have some flaws. Um, so look very intuitive, but uh, we can actually quite easily trick them. So uh, if you consider the efficacy here for these two cuts, so uh, the efficacy measure would actually prefer the blue cut over the orange one, because this line here is longer than this line. Yeah? So the distance between this point and those hyperplanes is larger for uh, the blue one. But actually, as you see, um, the orange cut is the, the better one. Uh, this cuts off more. And the reason is that uh, for this orange cut here, um, this projection is outside the actually, actual polyhedron. Uh, so you're taking the measure from a point that you um, wouldn't want to separate anyway. If you had selected some direction that goes inside the polyhedron, like the DCD, for example, this would not have happened in any case, the blue cut. Uh, the orange cut would have been scored higher than the blue one. So this is the issue with efficacy. Um, that's partially overcome by DCD. Um, and uh, an issue we both suffer from is dual degeneracy. 
So for those of you who have not heard this term before, this, the presence of dual degeneracy uh, means, basically means that uh, you have multiple alternative optimal solutions. So you have a full optimal phase, not just a single optimal point. And here again, if this is the solution that for whatever reason your simplex solver gives you, you would prefer the blue cut um, because this distance is slightly larger than this distance. But you see, if you would have um, ended up at this solution, then well, the blue cut wouldn't even have cut off the solution, and the orange cut would have been much better. So, um, and the same, essentially, the same argument that you have a, well, a random selection in the sense of which solution you end up with holds for DCD because you're computing your distance with respect to some more or less arbitrary feasible solution. Okay, so how might we do better here? Um, we might use analytic centers, which is something like a central point of a polyhedron. And um, there are two different kinds of analytic centers that we can consider. The analytic center of the optimal phase, which is something like the middle point here, and score cuts with respect to um, their distance to this point. And the analytic center of the whole polyhedron as a replacement drop in replacement for uh, the incumbent in DCD. So we'd always use the same point to refer to. And yeah, um, we want to choose between, well, these four and actually four other methods. More of this described in the paper. I only ripped off the machine learning part here. Um, how am I with time? Should five more minutes, right? Okay. Um, so, um, Okay, we want to determine the best selection criterion, well, out of eight, the four that we just saw and four other ones. And um, yeah, we want to compute which of them would produce the minimum tree size or the minimum runtime. We do um, use features that, well, refer to cutting plane sele selection like the dual and primal degeneracy. Yes? When you say which score will produce the minimum tree size, you mean you pick one of the scoring functions and then you rank the generated cuts according to that, and you take the top k? Yes. So, I mean, what we will, what we actually will do is this on this slide or on the next slide. Um, yeah, I think it's here. So we have like an uh, eight-fold um, decision that we have to do here. So what we will predict for each of these measures is how close is it to the optimal. Uh, and then we will take the side for the one that we predict to be closest for the optimal, and all of the cuts will be uh, ranked, scored with respect to this one fixed um, decided selection criterion. And also, this stays the same for all, uh, all of the tree search. We do again one off decision at the beginning of the search. Okay. And this we do coming from the following features do it in primal. The generous C, which might give an indication whether analytic centers would be worthwhile to uh, explore or not. Um, the solution fractionality, which is important, like foremost, this also gives an indication of how many cuts you will expect um, uh, in the first place. And then the last two features, the thinness of the problem. So how I many equality constraints do you have rather than inequalities? and the density of the whole constraint matrix, those are rather aiming uh, towards how expensive is it to compute those analytic centers. So for thin problems with the low de density, analytic center computation would be fast. For others, it might be very expensive and therefore not worthwhile pursuing. Okay, this we didn't test uh, in Express, but in Skip, so it's more of a prototypic uh, implementation at the, po at the moment. And, uh, Consequently, we didn't use customer instances, but our beloved MIPLIP 2017. Okay, um, I pres presented half of the slide already. So yeah, this is what we want to predict uh, for each of the selection criterion. So here with the example of the number of nodes, we did the same for the time. And uh, again, we did do uh, a regression here. Okay, some results. Um, very colorful, so these are boxing plots here. What you would see here is for all these eight different measures, um, plus our regression model, 
Here, what is the um, like for like for a box plot? What is the medium value? What are different percentiles? And these individual boxes here are just different percentile ranges um, plus outliers. And what you see here is this is a very nice result for the number of loads. So both the the median and uh, the maximum minimum values, all the different percentiles are better than for each individual method. This is not so much true for time. Yeah, for time, essentially, you are as good as uh, the DCD value, the analytic DCD. OK. Um, so, so what metric is presented on the left plot? It's kind the of number of nodes number in, of your, in your search key. The runtime. Runtime. Number of nodes on runtime. And um, what you might guess from, from this here, uh, if you look at the actual shifted geometric means of the one times, which you can't see from uh, these tables, what you do get is that our um, model performs better with respect to the number of nodes. The shifted geometric mean reduces by a couple of percent, but it's actually worse for one time. This is why this is not deployed by default. Yeah, but you trained by, to predict number of nodes, so why didn't you just train to predict runtime? No, these are uh, two um, different predictions here. Oh, so you retrained your regression yes, model yes, for yes. runtime? Yes, and we could get good results for minimizing the number of nodes, reducing the number of nodes, but not so much for uh, runtime. So this is work in progress, if you wish. Okay, as a nice side effect, um, this trained model, either of them, reduced performance variability. For those of you who know what this is, this is a nice, uh, nice result. Um, and what you see here as the last picture of today is a principal component analysis that we did. Um, and you see that the majority of the instances here, so each point here is one of our validation instances prefers one of the DCD variants, either the original one or the analytic center DCD. And if you look closer, you will see that uh, they are shaded differently. And this is um, um, telling you how good this measure actually was. So you, you predicted that you should use DCD if you have an, if this is not opaque, then this is actually the best measure that you could get. And something like this would be a misqualification. Okay. Um, One quick question. So yes. did you look into, like, you only have, like, what, six features or something? So did you look at what your model is learning about how to use these features in order to choose which uh, strategy to apply? Uh, so we could... Did you look at yeah. the features, weights, or importance within the learned model to understand which, like, which features were actually really used in the, your final predictions? Um, I mean, we looked into this for all... Um, for all projects that we saw today. So under the hood, like a feature reduction would have happened at all the cases. But you, had, you, you listed only six features or something. Yes. This so is this, a very small... Yeah, we started out with more and, uh -huh. and realized that some of those are not, are not used. And this is what but we... Among those six, you don't have further intuition, like one of them is more important than another, something like this? Mm, not this from the top of my head. Mark, can you, uh, do you have anything to add to this? No, this it's, it's a good, good question. I think I also saw you use a quadratic kernel, so you're also using combinations of features, I think, that complicate such an analysis. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, um, let me conclude no. in the last minus 10 seconds. I should say, by the way, we did, you, we did like a cubic kernel, but there was a linear one that performed slightly worse. Like in the end, there was like linear which performed bad, and then no matter what technique you used, they all seemed to perform similar. Well, they were slightly more complicated. And then we picked like the easiest non trivial one. Yeah, I, I was just <coughs> channeling George Nemhauser, who, when we did the first work on the learning to branch, mm -hmm. that was his question. Like, what can you tell me about insight of what, what, what's guiding the predictions that I can use to somehow hypothesize about what are the mm -hmm. important factors, right? And so yeah. I should, it's always interesting to do. Yeah. I mean, we had something of this, like this in our learning to scale paper, but I, I remember from there that there, for example, the matrix scaling was the most important feature, unsurprisingly, and then the other ones 
were slightly less important, but each of them was relevant. So, um, key takeaways from the presentation today. So, uh, we saw that modern MIP solvers, in our case Express and Skip, do use ML models to make decisions under the hood. Um, I personally find that improving general MIP is a rewarding and highly relevant uh, task or endeavor to take on, but it is very challenging. Um, also, we saw that faster is not the only definition of better for a MIP solver. So, the first project was on improving numeric stability. I mentioned performance variability, so those are valuable by itself. And then repeating again, using regression to do classification often works much better. I didn't show the results. We, in each of the cases, we also tried classification models, and they always were not that great. Okay. Um, some very quick announcements. Uh, in April, there will be a conference of the EU Practitioners Forum at ZIP-OR as a resilient technology. So, in a sense, lessons learned from the recent events, pandemic, war, climate change. Uh, the registration is still open. I'd be happy to see some of you there. There's the Express Best Paper Award. So, from the first edition, we will soon NISH announce the winners. This is a research award um, we can hand in a paper and yeah, win a prize. And one of the conditions is that you should have used Express inside your paper, but it's not uh, evaluated on, um, well, the price of Express there, but on the scientific quality of the paper, obviously. So maybe interesting for some of you, the next deadline is quite far in the future, um, by the end of the year. And um, there will be a summer school in September at ZIP together with a conference on optimization and machine learning. This is very much still in the planning. Um, still, you might want to take notes, let some of your students know, and yeah, soonish we will post more information at this point. Okay, thank you.